Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. This is number three in Daniel's last vision. Now, um, so over the first two, we, we just basically had an introduction, and then we discussed a number of things dealing with the chronology, and so we're going to continue with that. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so very grateful for your presence that is with us each day as we seek you, as we go through the day-to-day -day life that we have here on earth, in ministering to others, in seeking to perfect a Christian character. We are so very thankful that you are there. We ask, Lord, that you can be here now in a special way as we open your word together, that your Holy Spirit can speak to us, inspire us, as it did the Bible writers, and that we can um, interpret your word according to the truths that are there in contained. And we know, Lord, that our understanding of things is limited, and that we need your help. I pray for each person searching that you can help them in their day-to-day -day lives, and that you can help us now as we study together. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. So, <clears throat> a couple of points. Um, one of the points I want to address is a comment um, from the first video. So it's on the first video and the comment kind of disappears and reappears. So I just want to make sure that this comment is heard. Now, this is uh, Kathy Joseph. She puts this comment here on video number one. So she says, um, and let me see if I can find it because uh, she did update it. So she says, Theodore, within the first few minutes of this presentation, you claim that Colin's conclusion is the same mistake as the Millerites have made. And you haven't given any evidence as to why he is wrong. Is this going to be a study or a debate? A study is looking to see what the Bible has to tell us line upon line. The debate is trying to prove a person is incorrect. And then she has a comment about Pfizer, which is irrelevant. So, so the first thing is we're actually not having a debate. We're having a study. And that is, I stated that Colin's conclusion is the same mistakes that was made by the Millerites. So that's one thing that we're going to see. We're gonna see the mistakes that the Millerites made, and we're gonna see why that conclusion is based on the same basic error that the Millerites made in identifying the earth as the sanctuary that was to be cleansed on October 22, 1844. And that is, it's a mistake of between the literal and the symbolic, between the literal and the spiritual, right? And we saw that mistake in how they interpreted Daniel 11, verse 36 to 45, right? So that is, they did not understand uh, that they couldn't apply the literal Egypt as, as the king of the south, Right. The king of the south is going to be spiritually Sodom in Egypt, which is France. And they couldn't apply the king of the north to Turkey, Syria, the area occupied by Turkey, because that would be not using before the cross literal, after the cross spiritual. And the cross there in the connection of the king of the north and the king of the south has to do with the two desolating powers, paganism and papalism. So we know that after 538 AD, you're dealing with spiritual Babylon, correct? Not literal Babylon. So you would have to be dealing with the spiritual king of the north and the spiritual king of the south after 538. So, so that's, that's the point that's going to be seen. Now, of course, this isn't a debate because this is not an attack on Colin. Actually, what we believe is that Colin presented and was presented by God with certain insights that are essential for this movement at this time. That is the understanding of Daniel chapter three 
its connection to Daniel chapter 11, verses 1 to 4, and also the connection between Revelation 13 and 17. Now, we include there also the understanding of Revelation 12 and the pioneers' understandings of these um, prophecies in Revelation, Revelation 12, 13, and 17, is essential to understand our own application that we have made in the past, why it's a correct application, but also to recognize it is an application. It is not the interpretation of that prophecy. That the pioneer's understanding of 12, 13, and 17 is correct, as is the view that we hold regarding um, the seven heads of Revelation 17. So, so those things are not incompatible. So, so that's how we're approaching this study. So this study is meant to be an understanding of truth. It's not meant to be, um, you know, attack on any type of person in any sort of way. So when we say that Colin drew wrong conclusion, it's not an attack upon Colin as a person. Uh, we're not saying he's bad in doing so. We're saying it's actually normal for that to happen based upon the context of all of these things that God has been showing us. And it's going to take time as a movement to study through these things and come to the conclusion that God wants us to come to. And I don't have the answers to that. Right. So I'm not coming here saying I know all the answers to why what we what we're going to find when we look at these things. So so to me, this is an, an important point now. So the comment is there. And I said, like, the comment disappears. And so I reposted her comment and my reply to it. So anybody can look at it there. But some people might find her original comment is there, but I can't find it when I look at the video. It doesn't seem that anybody can. So I had reposted the comment. Um, but the comment does show up in my comments section when I look in my studio. So the comment is still technically there. It's just not visible. So I had to repost it. So hopefully that's clear. Um, so uh, other points that we had addressed uh, was the chronology that there is two times at the end in uh, that are being referred to here. That is, we're going to have uh, Darius the Mead. He's going. It's going to be a time at the end, right? Because that's going to be the fall of Babylon. It's the end of the seventy years for Babylon, and then we have a time at the end that occurs here, set being called the third year of Cyrus. We would actually call it the first year of Cyrus according to Daniel 1, verse 21. But it's the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, from the time that Babylon fell. So it's the third year since Babylon fell. And so in that sense, it's the third year of Cyrus. But as king of Babylon, it would be his first year. But he, he was king of lands. And so if you're talking about Cyrus as king of lands, then this would be his third year. So he had different titles, different ways of counting uh, his reign. So he has three different ways you can count his reign. Now, we also addressed uh, this three full weeks. And so we're saying that the three full weeks represents the 21 years from when Daniel is taken captive in the fall of 607 to the destruction of Jerusalem uh, in the summer of 586. So that is 21 years, and we're saying that these three full weeks symbolize that. Of the 70 years, if you take off 21 years, you have 49 years, a jubilee cycle. And so we're saying that when the Israelites returned, as we found in Ezra chapter 3, um, so when we look at Ezra chapter 3, I'll just go there quickly. When the seventh month was come, the children of Israel were in the cities. The people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. And there stood up Yeshua, the son of Josedek, and his brethren, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, his brethren, and builded the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. So they set up this altar, and that's going to be 
on Rosh Hashanah, the first day of the seventh month. Now, technically, in this sense, like if it is a jubilee, it should be on the 10th day of the seventh month. Um, but even though it doesn't specify that, we're saying that this symbolically is a jubilee year from the time that the temple was destroyed. So if you look at the temple being destroyed in 586, if you go to 536, that's going to be the 50th year. So that 50th year, which would begin in the spring of 536, it's in the fall that they mark the Jubilee. And so they're setting up the altar. So they, they're there returning in a Jubilee year. Now, we had some discussions regarding Jubilee years. So we know that there are three different Jubilee cycles that we can clear, clearly define. Now, some of them are a bit hard as far as which, which is the Jubilee year, but we should say three sabbatical cycles. And um, so when we try to apply those cycles in the present time, my view is that it's irrelevant. That is, I don't believe that we can mark some sabbatical year in our history as the sabbatical year or some year as the Jubilee year because we have three different cycles. And, and I don't think that there's any significance in some year saying, well, it's this sabbatical cycle we're going to look at this year as a significant year. That's my opinion, right? I could be wrong. Right. But I spent a lot of time on that. And so maybe that's part of the problem, looking at how people have tried to use these sabbatical and jubilee cycles. And I'm just saying, even if it is the case that one of those cycles happens to match up with something, it's not very unlikely if you have three cycles um, that one of those cycles is going to match up. You know, almost close to 50 percent of the time, 50 percent of the years are going to match up in some ways with one of those cycles. So it, it seems to me sort of statistically insignificant. If they happen to line up, there has to be some reason for it, right? So there'd have to be some rationale uh, of why you would say that cycle matches up. And, and maybe if it's a specific number of years and it's part of a structure, we can say this many years is symbolic and it's connected to this, like Stephen does with some of his diagrams, then we could make a case that that was significant. But it would probably occur after some events happen that we would recognize this. So we wouldn't recognize this uh, ahead of time, I don't think. Okay, so we have uh, this Jubilee idea. And um, was there anything else that we just kind of, any questions left unanswered there that we needed to resolve or things that, Because we did discuss the whole idea of the passive, right? So my belief is that from the destruction of the temple, they no longer observe the Passover or the Day of Atonement. And even after they rebuilt the temple, they did not observe the Day of Atonement. And we're not going to get into Nehemiah when they're going to actually observe the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, because they recognize they, they can't observe the Day of Atonement, but they still can keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So they choose to do that. Um, so that's, that would be the only reference to the Day of Atonement is that they can't keep it because there's no ark in uh, the most holy place of the sanctuary that they built. So the second temple doesn't have an ark, so they can't keep the Day of Atonement. It's pretty simple. Um, but also they're not keeping the Passover. So when Ezra travels um, from Babylon to Jerusalem, he's going to be leaving on the 12th day of the first month from the, um, the river Ahava. You know, if they were keeping the Passover, they wouldn't be traveling then on, you know, the 12th and 13th and 14th, right? So they're going to be traveling all that time during the Passover, during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, so they're not observing it. Right. And even though the temple has been rebuilt um, back in uh, 515, it had been dedicated and they kept the Passover. Right. Right. They're going to keep the Passover in 515 when they rebuild the temple. 
right? So we, we need to keep that in mind that we can go there. So just, um, so they're gonna keep the Passover, but that's in Jerusalem. So let me see here. So that's gonna be chapter six, right? So we have Darius's decree that completes the temple. Um, so the temple of the Jews build it. Uh, somebody's mic was making noise. Right. So it says um, the elders of the Jews, verse 14, build it and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai and the prophet of Zechariah, the son of Ido. And they built it and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel, and according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, kings, king of Persia. Now, notice he, he mentions Artaxerxes here, even though this is according to, uh, you know, this would be in 516. So you're going to have it years before uh, the temple, before Artaxerxes' decree. But of course, Ezra's writing this after Artaxerxes' decree. And he's showing that Artaxerxes' decree is included in this commandment, right? So Artaxerxes' decree, even though it's primarily about the civil authority, it does include um, offerings to the temple. And so it's included here. And the house was finished on the third day of the month, Adar, uh, which was in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. So that's going to be um, March um, 12th, 515 BC, the dedication happens, which is an inversion of the 12th day or, or the third day of the 12th month. Right, so we're going to have the 12th day of the third month, just an inversion of that date. <clears throat> and then it says uh, they, they're going to dedicate the house, house of God, and so forth. And then it says uh, in verse 19, and the children of the captivity kept the Passover upon the 14th day of the first month. For the priests and the Levites were purified together. All the men of all of them were pure and killed the Passover for all the children of the captivity and for their brethren and priests and for themselves. So again, we're going to see that after the temple is built, they are going to observe the Passover in Jerusalem. So Ezra, when he's traveling, because that's going to be in chapter 7, that we're going to have Ezra is going to travel from the first day of the first month to the first day of the fifth month from Babylon to Jerusalem. He's not observing the Passover because he's not in Jerusalem. And then obviously with Daniel, He's going to be before the temple is built. So Daniel is not going to be observing the Passover. There's no temple, right? The temple has been destroyed and it's going to be another 21 years until it's rebuilt and dedicated and the Passover is observed again. So any questions on any of that? Okay, so the the premise then is since the Passover is not being kept without the temple mm -hmm. and neither is the Day of Atonement being kept, mm -hmm. yet as they would they would do this, the the three feasts that they were commanded to keep would not be kept. Mm -hmm. So that means Passover, Feast of Weeks, and Tabernacles, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So, so the Tabernacles they're going to keep in the time of Nehemiah, even though they can't keep um, the Day of Atonement. So if you go to Nehemiah, I can't remember which chapter it is here. Okay, there's Nehemiah's prayer, Nehemiah sent to Judah, rebuilding the wall, opposition to the work. Um, just can't as relief. So they're going to read the law. So it's in this section. Um, um, so it's going to be, let me see here. So they read the book of the law in verse eight, and it says in verse nine, and Nehemiah, which is the Tershata, Tershata, 
the governor, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat and eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions unto them, for nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Um, so they keep talking about this day is holy. And, and I'm not sure, because um, I didn't look this up, because um, I haven't looked this up in the past, but I can't remember exactly how this works. Um, but I'm pretty sure that this is on the first day of the seventh month that they read this, right? I so believe gonna, you're right. Yeah. Um, I just can't remember. So they're saying, you know, this is Rosh Hashanah. Okay. That's the first day of the seventh month. And then on the second day, which I take as the second day of the seventh month, we gathered the chief of the fathers, all the people, and the priests and the Levites, unto Ezra the scribe, even to understand the words of the law. And they found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded by Moses, that the children of Israel should dwell in booths in the feast of the seventh month. Right. So it seems that what they, uh, the, my understanding is that they're looking at this. They, they can't observe the day of atonement. That's why they're mourning, but they can observe the feasts of booths. Right. And, and the reason I was studying this originally, because it's like 2015, because we're trying to find, you know, evidences regarding the day of atonement in the story of Ezra and Nehemiah. And so when we, got to Nehemiah, we recognized, well, okay, they couldn't keep the Day of Atonement, but they could keep the Feast of Booths. So that's, you know, the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, so they they kept the Feast seven days, and on the eighth day was a solemn assembly according to, unto the manner. So they're going to keep that from the 15th to the 22nd, right? So the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th, 20th. And then the 22nd is the eighth day, right? So they have that 15th to the eighth day. So anyway, that the, the point here is that there are they are observing some things. And, and they're going to observe the Passover, right? So after the temple is built. Um, but they're not observing the Passover when there is no temple. And, and the Day of Atonement, it appears that they can't keep it, but they can keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Does, does that help a bit? I'm just trying to fix that in my mind. So go ahead. So, so the point is when Daniel is going to be fasting, I mean, he can't possibly be keeping the Passover. And, and since there is no temple, and, and they don't keep that Passover until they rebuild the temple and dedicate it in 515, then there's no reason to believe that he's doing something special by not keeping the Passover here. Right? He's just not observing it because it's not being observed. And, but he's fasting during that period of time, so I think that would be significant, that he's doing it in that season, which we would call the Passover season. So then he's, he's going to do this. He's in um, Babylon. He's by the river Hittical. And so we talk about these two visions. That's um, the time of the end magazine. So <clears throat> there's the two rivers, right? In vision, in chapter 8, he's at the Ulai, right? Which is this river in Persia. Um, and we know that because, well, he's in the palace in Shushan. So Susa, um, the city of Susa is the capital of Persia. And that's where he is in vision. He's not literally there. And the suggestion by many is that that, that, cast, that um, palace did not exist um, 19 years prior to uh, Daniel chapter 10, because it's gonna be 19 years from when he has that vision in chapter 8 to the vision in chapter 10. 
right? So 19 years. And and the palace in Shushan the palace, if you talk about Shushan the palace, that would be something that many people believe was built by Darius the Great. So, so Daniel would be envisioning something in the future. Um, now, it's possible that he's envisioned in 457 BC at the beginning of the 2300 days. That's where he's brought to envision. Um, but that, that's not 100% clear. But here, he's actually literally by the Tigris. He's in Babylon. And then he's going to have this vision. So I think we have enough background to sort of look at this vision here um, to understand its context. I then lifted up mine eyes and looked and behold a certain man clothed in linen whose loins were girded with fine gold of Uphaz. Now, we also have Dwight's notes, which I probably should use here. because It's going to give us some things uh, to look at. So I'm going to switch my screen to these. Now, I like having this because I have the Hebrews numbers and I'm going to address some of those. But... Um, Okay, so here we are. We can see here, um, this says a certain man, um, and the translators put one man, behold, one man clothed in linen. Now, this idea of uh, certain, this word here is just ichad. So it's, it's the word that means a one as a unity, because yochid, is one as a singular, but ichad is one as a unity. So just means this one man, this he's he's clothed in linen. And his loins are girded with fine gold of Ufaz. Ufaz is a place. It's a, um, it's a place where they get gold. And um, what was the other point here? Okay, so... We know that in chapter 12, because you know, often we just read these tra chapters separately. So we know this is one vision, 10, 11, and 12. And in chapter 12, he's going to see uh, again, the man clothed in linen, right? And upon the waters of the river, right? So this Daniel, Daniel 12, uh, verse six, right? And he's gonna see two men in, Daniel chapter 12, right? So he says in Daniel 12, verse 5, Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two um, and, and I don't think that that's the best way to translate it. It's just saying there's another one. So there's two, and there's one next to the one on this side of the bank of the river. And the other on the other side of the bank of the river, right? And the one man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river. So there, I guess maybe there would be three. Is that is that how we would look at it? Here, let's go look at this. So we see um, in chapter 10, it talks about this man upon the waters of the river, right? Right. Okay. So in, in Daniel 12, then I looked... Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river and the other on the, that side of the bank of the river. And, and one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river. So there's two men added, right? And they're going to say to the one upon the waters of the river. So who's the one on the waters of the river? Christ. Christ, right? Right. And and we get the how long question. How long shall be the end of these wonders? Right. So these how longs, um, can we, can people remember all the significant how longs that are, that refer to prophetic uh, symbols? Well, we get the, the how long that has to deal with uh, the vision of the daily and the transgression of desolation. We get the how long that has to deal with the vision that is true. Right. And we have the how long in Revelation as well. Right. 
So, um, so those are the four that I know. I'm just going to see if I can find some more. I mean, there's some other, you know, how long you, you know, um, how long you halt between two opinions, those types of things. But as far as ones that are going to deal with prophetic periods, um, we have uh, just seeing here. So there's lots of how longs in the sense of just other reasons. So we got Daniel 12, 6, Daniel 8, 13, right? How long should be the vision? Um, and uh, the one in Revelation 6, 10, how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth, right? That how long is is going to be related to the 1260. So there's, it's connected to that. So we have these how longs. So, um, so if we look at this verse here, we got this how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And the answer to that is going to be 1260 years, but that's the for paganism, right? So when we read Daniel 12, Verse seven, we just generally read into this. Oh, it's for a time, times and a half. That's 1260 years. That must be the 1260 years of papal uh, supremacy. But Miller recognized that this was related to the pagan desolating power. Right. Right. So <clears throat> now he's going to uh, hold up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven. And swear by him that liveth forever, ever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people. So this is literal Israel. All these things shall be finished. So this is going to be addressing the scattering of the power of the holy people. The, people, the scattering is the first 1260. Right? So this is, is referring to that, uh, the 1260 of the northern kingdom. Now, there is a scattering connecting with the 2520 for Judah as well, but not for 1260 years. So this scattering here is going to be for uh, the persecution that happens under papal, papal Rome. And we know when we go to Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, it's going to talk about the, the time, times and a half. Um, and this is going to be this power that's going to tread down. Thus, he said, verse 23, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of the kingdom are ten kings that shall arise and another shall arise after them. And he shall be diverse from the first and shall, he shall subdue three kings and he shall speak great words against the most high and shall wear out the saints of the most high. And think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. So this is the 1260 of papal supremacy. And we know that the work of the papacy is this treading down. Right. So. <clears throat> um, if we look, it's in Revelation chapter 11, I think. Um Right. So in 11 verse uh, tw verse two, it says, uh, but the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not for it is given unto the Gentiles, for the nations and the holy city shall they tread underfoot 40 and two months. So this is the 1260. Again, you see the treading. That's the 1260 for the papacy. The scattering 1260 is for paganism. So paganism scatters, the papacy treads down. Is that any questions on those points? I think that's well presented. Yeah. Now we know, of course, Revelation 10 is going to be connected to, Reve to Daniel chapter 12, right? We're going to see a similar scene. Daniel chapter 12 is going to be the sealing up of the book of Daniel. Revelation 10 is going to be the unsealing of the book of Daniel, referred to as the little book, 
right, that we're going to take and eat. And, and there, when you have this, you know, the question of how long shall be the vision, right, or how long shall it be till the end of these wonders, it's going to be for a time, times and a half in chapter 10. Uh, it's going to be um, that there should be time no longer. Right, so it's kind of hard to read with all these Greek numbers in here. But it should be that there should be time no longer, right? So if you think about the context of Daniel 12, Daniel 12 is going to deal with a few different prophetic periods. The time, times and a half is the paganism uh, uh, scattering the power of the holy people. And there's the taking away of the daily paganism. And it's going to deal with the 1290 and the 1335. So the 1290 is going to end in 1798 and the 1335 in 1844, right? In the spring of 1844. So those two periods of time, when it talks about here in Revelation uh, 10 verse 6, that there should be time no longer. It must be referring to those time prophecies in Daniel, specifically the 1290 and the 1335, correct? Or am I reading into it? Repeat that question, please. So since Daniel 10 and Daniel 12 are connected, and the time periods in Daniel 12 are the ones that end in 1798 and 1844, that when it says that there is time no longer, it's referring to the end of those prophetic periods. Agreed. Okay. And now we take this, because Ellen White says this. She says, this is not the end of uh, this world's history. Or of, uh, how does she put that? Um, I need to find the statement. I don't want to misquote her. It's in 7A here. I'll find it really quickly. Um, because she's going to give us, to me, this was the her statements in um, um, in, 7, in 7A, right? SDA Bible Commentary 7A is um, – the thing that I used back in, in the eighties when I was dealing with people who were time setting. So I'm just going to quickly search this. Okay. Why is it not giving me that? Let's do this way. Hmm. This search engine doesn't always work. Um, That's pretty bad. Okay, I can't find the quote because the search engine won't allow me to find it. Let me see if I can find it some other way. Um, Here, there we go, this is easier. Um, She says, this time which the angel declares with a solemn oath is not the end of this world's history, neither of probationary time, but of prophetic time, which should precede the advent of our Lord. So if it's the end of prophetic time, how have we interpreted that in the movement? So what does she mean by the end of prophetic time? The end of the prophecies that are brought to view in the Bible. Right. Well, so, so, yeah. so all the prophetic periods, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, and we we agree with that. So we don't have any prophetic periods extending beyond 1844. Now we do have 
a prophetic mirror that is created by prophetic periods. But that prophetic mirror is not itself a prophetic period. That is the 2,604 years from 742 BC to 1863 is not a prophetic period. Does that make sense to people? Yeah. Okay. Now, some people would say we're, we're placing a prophetic period, but we're not. We're just seeing that there is naturally a mirror that the prophetic periods create. So we can, so it's not something that could have been anticipated or proclaimed. One of my main arguments about time setting in is that we can't predict what's going to be in the future, but we could look back at the past and see that there is structures, chronological structures and symbols that exist in the past. But we wouldn't um, predict something in the future based upon those structures. So if somebody had come along and said, well, we have two 2520s and there was a civil war. And that means we're going to have a civil war. So let's say somebody did this in 1850 and said, we're going to have a civil war in 1863. Um, and that during that civil war. Um, you know, we're going to organize the church and, and made all these prophecies, even though it had come. True, they couldn't have foreseen that, that there wouldn't be there wouldn't be any keys for them to allow to see what's going to happen in 1863. But after 1863, we could look back and see that. Right. But you can see that it would have been impossible to predict based upon God's word what was going to happen in 1863. Correct. OK. Even if you knew about the two twenty five twenties and you had the correct chronology, you wouldn't have been able to predict that. So so prophetic periods, by definition, are prophetic. Right. And a prophecy is something that's looking at the future. So after 1844, when she says then um, it's it's. Um, it's not the end of this earth's history, this world's history, neither probationary time, but a prophetic time, which should precede the advent of our Lord. That is, all of the prophetic time that's going to precede the advent of our Lord has already been accomplished in 1844. And she says, that is, the people will not have another message upon definite time. After this period of time, reaching from 1842 to 44, there can be no definite tracing of the prophetic time. The longest reckoning reaches to the autumn of 1844. So, <clears throat> so back in 2018, I looked at this statement and I said, if we can't reject what Ellen White says here. So if we are making a prediction regarding time, it can't be connected to the second coming of Christ and that it only can be applied to this movement. That is, we have this time came into the movement. My view was time came into the movement with a false time prediction. In 2012, Parmender said that the Sunday law is going to be in 2014. Even though the movement rejected it, the wheels were set in motion for this movement to make a time proclamation. Contrary to the councils in the spirit of prophecy, just as the Millerites did, contrary to the councils and the verses in the Bible that say we cannot know the day or the hour. Now, they tried to get around this, you know, where we're not saying the hour you know, or the exact day originally, just about the year 1843, and also. Um, that no man maketh know the day or the hour. Well, they said, you know, well, this is God making this known. Um, so, you know, and, and no man knoweth the day or hour, they look, maketh known. So they have these ways of arguing around these Bible verses. 
but they were obviously incorrect in doing so. Yet God led them in their proclamation of time. So they were correct as to the time, but wrong as to the event. We make the same case for July 18. July 18 is a correct date. We don't need to modify the date and move it to some other date. That date was given by God, and it's been witnessed to a billion ways. So now we have this, this date, but we realize that the event that we connected with that date was wrong. It is we have entered upon a time in which we can mark that God is leading this movement and that we're progressing towards the Sunday law. That's part of watching and waiting. But we're not going to know when those events are going to occur. <clears throat> So to me, all these points are essential to understand Daniel's last vision and what's happening here. So we have this um, Daniel chapter 10. We have this one clothed in linen. It's Christ. He's standing upon the waters of the river, right? right? It describes him. This is the description of Christ. His voice is like the voice of a multitude. And it says, I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision. But a great quaking fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. Now, what does this verse symbolize in this movement? And I'm just going to kind of jump in here. But we should be able to recognize what's happening. So who is Daniel first? In the context of the 144,000. Okay. Um, how would you have him represent the 144,000? What, what's your reasons? He's standing at the end. He is having, he's been shown all three visions, including the Mare. And by the looking glass vision specifically, He's having to compare himself with Christ. Okay. Yeah. So the vision here is the looking glass vision, right? That's what you're referring to. Correct. This vision is not uh, the mar -e, It's the mar -a, Right? Correct. Okay. And that is, it's not 4758. It's 4759. Correct. It's the feminine form. Of four seven five eight, because right. four seven is masculine. Okay, and so this vision that he sees, you're saying it's this is the looking at glass vision. Now, also the Hebrew number for Daniel is eighteen forty. So, what would that signify? Beyond the time frame of eighteen forty. Okay, well, there is a group of people who understand 1840. Right. That's this movement. We have light into 1840. Right. Now, we, we can also say that, you know, 1840, we, if we go August 11th, 1840, we know that that's going to be this 1,533 days to October 22, 1844. Um. So this represents a message that understands Millerite history from 1840 to 1844. Right. Okay. So that's this movement. That is the thing that's going to be sealed up in Revelation chapter 10, the seven thunders, right? And which this movement has unsealed. That is, we are the ones who understand Millerite history. Out of all the things we understand, the thing that's the most unique is our understanding of the chronology of 457 BC and 1844. We have insights into that chronology that no one else has. The prophetic mirrors, the, the different uh, chiasms that exist. Because we have a chiasm that exists. And if you think about this, right, if you think about all these connections that we have, remember Samuel Snow's letters 
represent that 126 days from his first letter to uh, his uh, Pentecost letter that's divided with April 19th in the center. So there's two periods of 63 days on either side. And that parallels exactly from June 9th, 2018 to October 13th, right? With August 11th in the center, right? And we can break that all out. We can line up Samuel Snow's letters with the dates that we had established symbolically in 2018. So that history, that understanding that we have is unique to this movement. Obviously, other people outside the movement aren't going to see the connection of Samuel Snow's letters to our movement. But we're actually the only ones that I know of that understand Samuel Snow's letters, the chronology of it, the two chiasms that are existed, because there's another chiasm with um, his second letter, his May 2nd letter as the center. And, and, and we need to look at those in a little bit in more detail because we, we've addressed them before, but we're going to address them further. Because in understanding this vision of Daniel, Daniel's last vision, if we're making an application to our time, just like we did with the book of Judges, we're going to see that we have several lines and that we can line these lines up with events in our history. Right. And, and we're using things like Daniel's Hebrew number for the definition in Strong's as being 1840. So it tells us something about Daniel. So I would agree, you know, he represents the 144,000, but more specifically, he represents the understanding that this movement has regarding 1840. Right. And this movement as far as I know, is the only ones who understand the 26th day of the fourth month in 1840, how it's connected to the 26th day of the fourth month in 1299 and 1449 and 1809 and 1839, right? Those symbols of July 27th and the 26th day of the fourth month, how they come together. So there's all this understanding that God has given this movement and it's extremely profound and it's symbolized by Daniel's Hebrew number. Okay. All right. <clears throat> um, now, just some other numbers there. So if we look at Daniel 10.7, is Daniel 10.7 as a symbol significant? Should it, we draw our attention to this verse? What what is it that about Daniel ten seven that should draw our attention? Ten seven meaning the day of atonement. Right. So the tenth day of the seventh month. And and here we're going to be drawn. Because he's going to say, I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. So we have a looking glass vision here. We have Daniel referring to himself, I, Daniel, right? Right. Um, now, he's going to say, I, Daniel, in verse 2 as well, right? So we can see that in those days, I, Daniel, right? But the fact that he says it here in verse 7 again is important because it's 10 verse seven. And uh, we're gonna have the word vision, that's going to be um, this looking glass vision. So we know that if we look at verse uh, six, we're gonna see this word appearance, right? And the face and the appearance, notice the word appearance there is mara, right? Right. Mar, Mar, it's actually Mare, but Mare, okay, four, seven, five, eight, right? So he's going to see this vision of Christ, and and then you're going to also he's going to have vision mentioned here uh, in verse one, but that again is going to be a Mare, right? The E H at the end 
in English. Okay. And we know that this is in the context of the great controversy because the time appointed was long is referring to the conflict was great. He had understanding of the thing that is the Dabar, right? And we're saying that that would be a reference to, to what? What's the thing that he had understood? What's, what's the word, the Dabar, that he understood? Because he has understanding of the vision. We're saying that's the vision of the evenings and mornings. So he understands the 2300 days. What is the thing that he had understand, understood? Anybody know? The implication of the vision of the evenings and the mornings. Okay. Um, okay. Why would you? Why would you say the thing? Because we have the vision is the evenings and mornings. So the thing that he understands. Why would you say that that's um, also the evenings and mornings? Because he had to learn to separate this from the other two visions. Okay. Um, so the other two being? The vision of the daily and the transgression which maketh desolate and the vision of with the looking glass. Okay. Um so I take this as Daniel 9.23, but so I'm taking that that when it says he had understanding of the thing, I'm saying that this is 9.23. At the beginning of the supplica supplications, the commandment came forth, and I'm come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved, therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. So we have the same expression there, except it doesn't say thing, it says matter. Okay, but isn't it your you the the use of the Hebrew yeah. translated two different ways? Yeah. You have the debar as the commandment and you have the debar as the matter. And also the thing. So Correct. three different. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm saying that what's being referred to in 10 verse 1 is the 70 weeks because he's told to understand the matter and consider the vision and the matter to me would be the 70 weeks that's what he's being shown and he's going to consider it in the context of the 2300 days So, so it connects the 70 weeks and the 2300 days. So this is an argument I've made for years, right? So when he had, when he understood the thing, that's the 70 weeks and he had understanding of the vision, that's the 2300 days. That those two things are connected. Daniel right. understood that, right? So as a Seventh-day Adventist, I've made this argument that the 70 weeks and the 2300 days are connected. Daniel understood this. But now he's going to pray because now that he has the understanding of those two things, he has this conflict. So he knows that they haven't returned back to the land yet, right? To Jerusalem. Babylon has fallen, right? He's already addressed that in chapter nine, right? Because that's what he was concerned about, the end of the 70 years that he had been or that Babylon had been there and he knows there's 70 years of the rest of the land so he knows that that's coming up and now here at the time that they're supposed to be returning to Jerusalem he's now fasting but he understands the 70 weeks and the 2300 days so he begins this period of of mourning 
right? Where he's going to fast. And then 21 days after he begins, the Christ comes to him, right? And then he has this vision. And this vision is the looking glass vision. And he sees a vision of Christ. Take a look at a comment in the chats. Okay. Uh, yeah, he's the judge of God cannot refer, can refer to not only the day of atonement, but the investigative judgment, since Daniel means judge of God. Yeah. So we would connect Daniel's name to the um, to the judgment, which is what the Day of Atonement is about. So he's symbolizing that. And, and if we think about that, you know, October 22 is going to be this date that's being marked from 1840 to 1844. It's 1533 days, the glorious manifestation of the power of God. So now if we apply this to our time, so if we say this, this is the looking glass vision that we need to to have, that is, we need a revelation of Christ. Now, what about the great quaking? So there, there's two points. One is, he's the only one that sees the vision, right? The men that were with him do not see it. Correct. And there's going to be a great quaking that falls upon them. And, and we would have to take this as a symbol, right? How else? I mean, it's, it's not, this is not a literal for us. Right. So we're taking it as a symbol. So we're not looking for an earthquake. But we do know there is a shaking. Right. The sifting and the shaking. So we know what causes the shaking, according to the spirit of prophecy. Isn't the shaking a revelation showing what the wheat and the tares are? I mean, I'm taking a guess at that. Okay, but, but Ellen White says what causes the shaking. It's Christian experience and teachings of Ellen G. White. It's in there. It's other places. It's, uh, would it be um, Ezekiel 37? No. Well, I mean, we can relate that. But Ellen White makes a statement of what had, so she says, I was asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen, and I was shown that it would be caused by what? Would it be a study of uh, Revelation and Daniel? No, that's not what she says. We should know this statement. Right? Every one of us should know this statement. It was caused by the straight testimony, right? All right. Called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. Okay. So we all know that statement now, right? Now, if we think about the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans, we obviously go to Revelation chapter 3, the church of Laodicea. But is there more that we can see connected to Daniel chapter 10? Because we have some people that see the vision, that is, they have the looking glass vision. But there's another group that doesn't. And those people are going to be shaken out, right? Right. So, so Ellen White says, this will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver, right? That we can say that this looking glass vision is the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans, right? If we understand what that is, you know, you don't know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. 
right? That's that's the condition that we are in. And if you say, well, I'm not wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, you're actually testifying to the fact that you are, right? Right. Okay. So God has to give us something to show us our true spiritual condition. And we call this the mare, the mara vision, or whatever it is. I can never remember how people pronounce it. But anyway, the feminine form, the looking glass vision. Right? So we have this looking glass vision that has to happen in order for us to see our true spiritual condition. Now, then she says, some will not bear this straight testimony. So this is a testimony that comes from Christ, from his word. Some people can't bear it. They, it says they will rise up against it. And this is what will cause a shaking among God's people. So notice when those people rise up against it, it causes the shaking. Now, the shaking is caused, she says, two different ways. It would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness of the Laodiceans. This has effect upon the receiver. So there's those that receive it, and it will lead them to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. But there's also an effect by those who reject it, because some can't bear the straight testimony, and they rise up against it. And this is what it causes the shaking among God's people. So in a sense, there's two aspects to it, right? There isn't just the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans that causes the shaking here. I should show you the statement, right? So here's the statement, um, page 176 um, in Christian Experience and Teachings of Ellen G. White. Now it's also in early writings as well, I believe. Yeah. Anyway, it's in other places, but here we have it. And, and so we can see that there's a twofold aspect to it. You have a group of people that, um, that are going to accept the message and a group that are going to reject it. And these two things cause the shaking. So we need to make sure that we accept whatever this true counsel or true witness, the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans is. So at first we know it's something that shows us our true spiritual condition, which we're not aware of. If we were aware of it, we wouldn't need the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans to show us this. We wouldn't need this revelation of Christ. <clears throat> so that makes sense to people, what we're talking about here? I think that's a point worthy of consideration. Now, so when we, so when we have this vision, we see what, what it is. It's a certain man that this is this man. He's one. He's united. Right. He represents the fullness of the Godhead. In one person. Right. Now he's clothed in linen. So that garment that he has. Is the righteousness of Christ. He's righteous in character. Now his loins were good with the fine gold of Ufa. So he's he's very bright. He's golden. His body was also like the burl. Now the burl is um, a, a precious stone. What color is a barrel stone? Anybody know? Why, why, do they, why do they use that word? Isn't it turquoise? Well, it's green. It's not, I always think it is green, but it's, uh, it's kind of a pale green. Um, but that's that's the word that they're using. Sometimes it can be yellow. You can have different colors, of course. It could also be uh, even a bit more transparent. 
at different times. So we got gold and we have barrel. That was my mom's name, barrel, barrel. <clears throat> So why this stone? And it's pronounced in Hebrew Tarish, Tarshish, Tarshish, Tarshish. It, it shows up in Daniel and Ezekiel and also in the Song of Solomon. It could be a yellow jasper or yellow colored stone. So it could be yellow. Could be. So one of the problems with uh, nomenclature, that is the naming of things, is that the same word can often be referring to different things in different cultures. So. But anyway, he it's a glittering stone. And his face is as the appearance of lightning. So there in the appearance, we have that word. That's the 2300 days. Right. His eyes, that's I in, as lamps of fire and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass. And the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. Now, now brass is, I mean, again, it's one of those words, whether it refers to bronze or brass, copper, right? So we have these different words. It could be copper. So copper is kind of a brown metal. Um, if you mix it with uh, different metals, um, I can't remember which metals. I think there's nickel, there's tin. Uh, you can get different things. We could get bronze or brass. But it probably refers to copper. So these different metals. So he's got he's got um, gold, barrel, um, lightning, and copper. And then the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. So again, his words is going to be that Hebrew word dabar, in this case, plural, dabarim. And like the voice of a multitude. So voice is going to be kol. We have its uh, kof um, and lamed. It's pronounced kol. So it's a voice of a multitude. A noise, a tumult. Okay, so what does all this mean? Right? We're looking at this description of Christ. And this is going to be the Mara version. Vision, pardon me. And it's going to be, it's going to be the looking glass vision. So what do all these things represent? We can say the linen represents Christ's character. Why are we given these symbols here in Daniel chapter 10 of what Christ looks like? Because we would take them as symbols, right? Correct. Okay. So we could look up each of these symbols. We look at lightning. What does lightning represent? It's got a few different things attached to it. A revelation. Okay, revelation, right? And we know it. the second coming is, is like the lightning, right? It stretches across the sky, right? So it's, it's about everyone sees the lightning. Um, it also refers to speed. Right. The angels are like lightning in how they travel. Um, uh, we also see lightning in connection with the giving of the law and with the glory of God.
Now, his eyes as lamps of fire. And we can think of lamps. These are things connected with the sanctuary, right? But what about eyes? The eyes of the Lord go to and fro upon the earth. So this refers to the, the searching characteristic of God. So in this revelation of Christ, in this looking glass vision, we know that nothing is going to be hid. Now we have his arms, that's his might, his power, his feet is refers to a message. And these are like to polish brass. So this would probably be some kind of refined copper. Right? So something that looks very gold-like. And then this word polished. Uh, if we can get it. Um, brightened as if sharpened or burnished. Polished. Cologne. Burnished? Yeah, so varnish. So it's something very shiny. So shiny brass. Now we know what does brass represent? The heaven shall be as iron, the earth as brass. Judgment. Yeah, so it referred to the judgment. So this is Christ. Really, it's representing his work as our high priest as well. Right? Correct. Okay. And then we have the voice of his words, like the voice of a multitude. So this is a parallel of the Debar. And I'm saying that the Debar, I mean, in the one context, it refers to the 70 weeks. But it, it refers to all prophetic messages. So if we're going to say the voice of his words, that's all of the messages that God has given. Right? So we can see that this revelation of Christ doesn't come by us, you know, sitting in our room, fasting and praying until, you know, we finally have some vision of Jesus. This vision of Jesus comes from a study of God's word of the prophecies. Right, because what people are looking for is some sort of spiritual manifestation. But God's not going to give us a spiritual manifestation when we neglect the manifestation of his character that he's given us. Right, so people want to hit this spiritual lottery, right? That something's going to happen. Christ will reveal himself to them. They'll see this vision of Christ like Ezekiel did or like Daniel did, right? Or like Job did or like John did, right? So they receive this vision of Christ and now they're going to be God's messenger. They're going to be somehow perfected in some ways. But we know that these are symbols to be understood about what's going to happen. And the symbols that are given here refer to an understanding of God's word to certain messages. So somebody who rejects, you know, the understanding of Revelation 9, the 26th day of the fourth month, or who rejects all of the things that led to July 18, are they going to receive this vision, this looking glass vision? No. Because the looking glass vision is already there for us to see. So we need to understand these, these prophecies. We need to understand the sanctuary. We need to understand Christ's character. We need, and it's revealed to us through these types and these symbols in God's word. So for us, this looking glass vision is going to come by studying the Bible and the prophecies. The very thing that we have been studying when we're looking at the book of Judges and we see all of these time elements, 
that relate to our movement. This is the looking glass vision. Can people agree with me on that? Or do, is there people that disagree? I'm not going to disagree with you. The only, the only thing I'm going to add, okay. as we have been dealing with this every Sabbath, mm -hmm. we not only need to combine this with what we're finding in judges as we have been studying it, mm -hmm. we're going to have to look at these prophecies also through the lens of the minor prophets. Right. So that's what we've been doing. And also the study dealing with the third, the three angels messages of righteousness by faith. Right. So all the studies that we've been doing all come together to bear upon this. Exactly. Now, so when he says in 10 verse seven, I, I Daniel alone saw the vision for the men that were with me saw not the vision. So we know that there is going to be those who understand Millerite history who are going to see the vision. But there's going to be others who are there with Daniel but are not going to see the vision. And then this great quaking that falls upon them is this shaking, this separation that happens. Right. Right. As we're making this application to this movement, we know that if we don't understand these truths, we will be shaken out. So in verse 8, Daniel says, therefore, I was left alone and saw this great vision. And there remain no strength in me. So those who see this vision are not going to trust in self. For my comeliness was turned in me into corruption. And I retain no strength. Now, um, and any thoughts on this? Because I'm going to bring up another point just dealing with some of the Hebrew numbers. But uh... now, I, I want to I want to look at this one number. This number eight five three. You'll see there in brackets. So Daniel ten verse five. You see, it has this 853 in brackets. Do, do people know what that word is and why it's in brackets? No. Okay. So I'm going to go to Leviticus 26. And you can see this. Um, so the first time I, I paid attention to it was in Leviticus 26. And that's in, in that first, uh, and it's, you're going to see it all through here, but in, in the first of the seven times. I will break the pride of your power. I will make your heaven as iron, and your earth as brass. And so you see this word, 853. Now, for those of you who sign into uh, this and have to put the password to get to the Zoom study, what what's the password for the Zoom study? Do you have it memorized? Five two six eight five three. Yeah, so it's five two six eight five three. Now five two six is the apartment that I have at Telford Muse, apartment five two six, which I'll still have till the end of this month, and then eight five three. I recognize it's this number. That's how I remember numbers, partly. So 853, I always think of the last part of the password. Now, now this word, et, so it's just um, uh, an aleph and a tav. So what does that tell you about this word? It's two Hebrew letters, aleph and tav. What are those two letters?
is all of the, the first letter and Tav the last? Yes. Okay. So, so you have the first and the last letter. Okay. Um, you know, and when I was growing up, my, my postal code in Canada, T5A, T Tav being the last letter and A being the first letter. Um, and then zero Z seven, A being the first letter, Z being the last letter was built into my, my postal code. T5A zero Z seven, right? And then of course, uh, I have a seven there and then the 50. Five, zero, seven are the numbers, and T, A, Z, for you Americans, that Z, uh, Z uh, being the last letter of uh, the English alphabet, Z being the last letter of the American alphabet, right? But anyway, so in my postal code, I have this, uh, these symbols, right? Uh, which I recognized, right? So I know that T is Tav, Aleph, A, and Z, of course, the last letter of English. Now, you know, can't make too much about this except the idea that we have the first and the last, Alpha and Omega in Greek. Alpha being like Aleph in Hebrew, and Omega is is the big O. Right, because you got Omicron, that's the small O, the little O, and then Omega is Omega, means big, right? So that's the last letter of the Greek alphabet. Okay. So if we have this symbol here, this et, it's, it's a word that means a sign of the definite direct object. So it's just a grammar marker to show that something's the definite direct object, right? So not everybody knows what a direct object is, but you know, in a sentence, you have an object and the subject, right? The right. object is, is what does the action and the subject is the thing that the action is done too. There's different ways in which that's understood depending on the type of action, right? Okay, so, but the definite, so it's a sign of the definite direct object. It's not translated in English, but generally preceding and indicating the accusative. Now the accusative is another part of speech, right? Does anybody, we don't really talk about this too much in English grammar, but what's the accusative? I, I don't even remember. Accusative, it's a case. So it, it's all this technical word. Accusative case of a noun is the grammatical case used to receive the direct object of a transitive verb. So an example of an acute, I'm going to hit your face. That's an accusative. Your face is the end of the ultimate goal of my hitting. And so it goes into the accusative case, right? So I know that's rather complicated, but I lifted up mine eyes. So that's referring to the accusative case, right, in that verse. And then I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. Now we're looking here at this, this, this Hebrew word that's not even translated in English. And we're tying it to the alpha and the omega. We're tying it to the password uh, to get onto this Zoom study. We're tying it to, because of the alpha and omega, to my post code when I was a kid. Um, so what does that all mean? In the context, we have these, these words, Daniel 1840, uh, we have this 853. What, what is this telling us? What are these symbols in Daniel 10 verse seven? What are, what are they trying to say to us? Now, 
Now, now, even the word saw. Now, saw is a really common Hebrew word. It's just the word ra'ah, to see, literally or figuratively. And that's 7200, zero, so 7200. What would be the significance of that? It's going to occur all through the Bible. Yeah. Translated to see and saw, seen, showed, appeared. Okay, so what, what are we doing with these words? How can we tie this? So we're going to come back to this tomorrow. We're going to look at these words and try to make some sense out of them, these Hebrew numbers. Okay, any final comments before we close with prayer? Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study. And we just ask for your continued help as we look at these things. We know that there's much we don't understand. And we just ask for your spirit uh, to enlighten our minds. We ask for a revelation of Jesus Christ. That we can see ourselves as we truly are and that we can trust fully in you. Be with each person, bless them. We pray and ask in Jesus' name, amen.